tube, I picked up the tube paper, the, the metro, and uh, as I was thinking of uh, how I'm going to introduce the idea of what is the need in the world to which the School of Commoning tries to give an answer. And uh, the headline from the, this today's paper just jumped to my eyes. 40 million jobs may go as global crisis deepens. 40 million jobs uh, may go by the end of next year in the uh, industrial countries. And according to the projections of uh, OECD, the Organization of Cooperation and Development, it's uh, in addition to the 20 million that has already gone since the financial downturn of 2008. So uh, there is a need for all those people who are losing their job, what they are going to do. And of course, the School of Commoning is not uh, a job uh, providing, not a uh, job training institution, but the commons uh, may well be the answer for many people who get out from the private sector and uh, they have a chance, a so-called chance, to hold their hands to uh, the father state to give me some handouts or start their own thing coming together with, with others and uh, start creating commons for uh, creating their livelihood. Together. There are some examples of that. I'm not going to go into the into details now. Just wanted to say a few words. So thrilled by having James here and having him as a senior advisor to our School of Commoning. Uh, this not only because James is a decent human being, <laughs> but also uh, because he is the the most radical thinker of the Commons movement. And when I say radical, I mean in a very specific sense. Radical means, comes from the Latin, the root, that he is really going to the root of the social illnesses and the roots of what would it take to change uh, society for the better. And he's also radical in another sense. That is, um, well, he's un he understands that uh, the root is uh, not only in our culture, in our social structures that uh, need to have a radical overhaul, but also in the structures of consciousness that needs to evolve. Uh, if not, we are going to recreate the same thing. So with this, I'm passing the floor to, to James. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this presentation will be about 75 minutes and then follow up with questions and answers. I want to thank George and Anna and, and uh, Tia and Mark and the rest of the people in the School for Commoning for inviting me to come. And I'm really delighted to be here to make this presentation for you. I developed this PowerPoint expressly for this presentation and I'm, I think it will possibly be available uh, in the future because it's being uh, videotaped. And um, made possibly made available uh, for further consumption because um, as many people have said about my writing that it takes more than one reading to really get the gist of it. I tell a, a big story in uh, a short period of time and I think you'll have that experience uh, going through the next 75 minutes. So um, the first thing I want to really talk about in reference to the Commons is uh, the UK uh, conditioning about what the commons means. It's, this is not about the House of Commons. It's not about the, the typical uh, British slant on what the commons means. Just remove that from your thinking and, and we won't have that kind of cognitive resistance because um, the commons actually came from something very important in the vocabulary of the British Isles, which was commoners back in the days of Robin Hood and prior to that. Um, and so, uh, talk about radical. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty radical stuff. Getting back to four pre, you know, into the prehistory of uh, society, uh, modern society at least. And um, so, what we are going to be really focusing on, I think, uh, more than anything else, is 
Um, now I'm having a problem with my clicker, so I might have to do this manually. I don't know why that would be. So I will have to do it manually. Oh, that's fine. Um, yeah. What we're really going to be looking at is what a commons-based approach is, because the word commons is confusing. And we're really trying to define a paradigm about the commons, not as a metaphor, well, it's the common good, we all know what that is. We're trying to make it a structural principle, because there is such a thing. And there has been enough analysis over the years and enough practice of the commons to really introduce this topic in a brand new way. And that is uh, what is so exciting about the commons based approach as we look forward to it in the elucidation of it uh, in uh, coming years. Commons obviously involves local commons and global commons. And it's that distinction that I want to be sharp about in this presentation. First part of the presentation will focus on the local commons, and then we'll get into uh, the meaning of the um, global commons after that. Um, the local commons are uh, commons that we're more familiar with at community and regional levels. Um, the commons are largely a territorial concept involving local appropriation, use, and benefit of a good or property, local in scope. And therefore, we understand that it's a community-based kind of management of a resource. At the global level, commons are more of a functional concept, not a territorial concept, involving sovereign resource management. Of course, it's territorial also, but there's a heavier emphasis on functionality of the management of the resource. Um, so what we have now is a misunderstanding about the global commons and the local commons in many respects because there are vast differences in scale because the commons is interpreted differently at the local level than it is at the global level. Governance and institutional linkages for local commons don't yet scale up or down from the community to the international level. And increasingly, this is happening. We are creating scale, but it's not happening quite quickly enough to talk meaningfully about the local commons and the global commons being the same thing. Um, achieving scale is, uh, is very possible now because of the um, vision that many people have about the multi-level management of the commons, which is now arising, as, as we all know, um, through globalization through the openness of political systems and the interconnectivity of economies and information networks. This is really speeding up the process that we might also call co-evolution, which has a, uh, a nature of the, uh, that it's subjective and intersubjective. So it gets deeply into uh, the human uh, neosphere or mind, um, the moral, the ethical, the uh, subjective. And achieving scale is also a matter uh, of envisioning these multi-level management systems from local to global, um, requiring principles and linkages that reach from local levels of social and political organization to higher levels of multilateral governance. So this would really bring the linkages into effect between the global and the local. And that is the nature of the presentation I'm going to be making today, how we get to that point. Local commons, as I say, have a rich history. But the modern history of the commons has been pretty much defined in this concept of the tragedy of the commons. And I'm sure you've all heard of that. It's been popularized by Garrett Hardin in 1968 in an article he published in the journal Science. And what he said, just to paraphrase, uh, paraphrase his long essay, is that when a pasture is shared by herders, there is no incentive to limit the number of cattle that an individual herder puts into the pasture. And that's uh, a concept that has been picked up upon by the free market economy, who agree with that and say, see, this proves that only market-based solutions to manage a local um, resource system are going to work, or possibly a government solution. But the only two possibilities for the management of local resources would be private and state, and really nothing else, because the people, the herders, are not wise enough 
savvy enough, don't have the experience to manage their own resources. Um, so what happens in this case is the pasture will be overgrazed and destroyed, according to Hardin, and nobody could agree more than the, the market system and governments who want to continue to reify their power by claiming that people can't manage their resources locally. But what Eleanor Ostrom and many other commoners have pointed out is that what Hardin was referring to was an open access regime, not a commons. This is a very important distinction. And this is where we start in really understanding what the commons means for us. Hardin was describing an open access regime with no community, no rules, and no boundaries for resource management among the herders. Now, this is not only not a commons, this is a mindset that comes out of a particular ideology that we are attacking or trying to overturn or at least to try to redefine. So, in essence, what are the commons? Uh, the distinction between open access resources can be seen in another way, vis-a-vis -vis what the commons are. The distinction in the academic community coming out of Bloomington School, which is the Indiana University um, and theory of analysis pioneered by Vincent and Eleanor Ostrom and many others, talks about common pool resources. Common pool resources are really referring to the unorganized and unclaimed resources that John Locke and others said that we find freely in nature and then we begin to organize. But before they were organized, they were found freely in nature. They're not organized by definition. So they're not commons, they're common pool resources. They become commons when they begin to get organized. That's the definition of commons. So a lot of people getting into the field begin to think that the commons is the, the atmosphere or it's the, the, the high seas that are unregulated. And, but no, those are common pool resources. And at one point, you know, in prehistory, it was all common pool resources before we had private sector and state to manage these resources. Um, but gradually, um, as people at local levels began to organize through their community, these common pool resources, then they did become commons. So that's the, the first real major distinction to make, common pool resources and open access regimes versus commons, which are organized. So there are many elements to a commons. Um, the institutional analysis uh, uh, regimen, which is uh, pioneered by the Ostroms in, at Indiana University and others, have developed different variables for what commons represent, but really they come down to five different things in my read of this, to simplify it. Um, the commons involve resources, which can be replenishable resources that we all know about, intellectual ideas, um, intellectual property, um, from replenishable resources to depletable resources, which the environmental movement has focused on. The resources that cannot be replenished and are therefore scarce and need to be protected. So the resources are very important, whether they're material or immaterial. The second thing, of course, is the people who organize the resource and share it as users, as resource managers, producers, and providers. Those are all important distinctions. And the third variable is the boundaries that specify the community membership for that particular resource and the extent of the resource. So since the mists of history, when human beings began to organize their resources, they always put some kind of formal or informal boundaries around them to say, this is our property, that's yours, and you stay over there, we'll stay over here. But beyond that, um, in terms of claiming property rights, it's this propertization that doesn't have to be privatized, but can be addressed through informal norms so that the, the people in the community over here don't necessarily have to be at war with the people over there who are managing those particular ecosystems or the different resources in different places. The fourth variable that's very important to recognize are the rules that govern people's access to and benefit from these commons resources. The rules are absolutely vital because they uh, aren't necessarily written down rules, but they can be informal rules and norms that a community creates 
to manage their resources. But the commons literature is very clear that norms and rules are vital to the management of a resource. They distinguish common pool resources uh, from commons. It's the creation of rules that is really essential. And the last point, the last variable about the basic elements of the commons involves the value that's created through the preservation and production of these common goods. This value is very important because we have to be able to distinguish it from monetary value. The Robert Costanzas and Paul Hawkins of the world would have you think that there is such a thing as sustainability and natural capitalism based on something pure in nature that's inalienable. But then they turn around and say, and we can prove that by showing you how much it's worth. You know, an ecosystem is worth $17 billion or whatever the figure might be. That's for us cognitively to satisfy our longing to figure out what the value is. But the point is that resources like this are too precious to be accountable in monetary terms. We need another set of metrics, which we'll get into shortly um, in the other half of this presentation. But it's the value of the shared meaning of the resources, not their worth in the marketplace, that really is what the commons movement is all about. And one of the things that distinguishes it from what the state or the marketplace really calls value. This is very important. Habermas and Foucault and others set the stage for us to understand what this means in terms of our inner subjectivity. And now the commons movement, as a group of activists, are actually beginning to apply this. In other words, we're defining what this new sense of value is apart from the marketplace and apart from what you might call fungible value. What are common goods? This is where it gets really interesting and where it helps to congeal the whole perspective of the commons because we can refer to commons in many different ways. We spoke earlier about commons being both immaterial and material which gives philosophers a headache because, and scientists as well, because they don't like that kind of bridging between the material and immaterial because uh, metaphysically and epistemologically it seems to violate their sense of uh, principles um, and in some ways it does and from a very strictly scientific point of view. This is precisely the barrier that the commons is breaking down because there are principles that apply to social commons and cultural commons intellectual commons and natural, genetic, and material commons that are uh, across the board, which are extremely important. And with Anna's assistance, I'm going to describe uh, for you what the social, cultural, and intellectual commons are. She's going to read these off because I think it's very important. These are categories that you are all familiar with, but I think it's important to name them. And there are many other commons in this category. So examples of social, cultural, and intellectual commons include indigenous culture and traditions, community support systems, neighborhoods, voluntary associations, labor relations, women and children's rights, family life, health, education, creative works, languages, words, numbers, symbols, holidays, calendars, stores of human knowledge and wisdom. Scientific knowledge, ethnobotanical knowledge, ideas, intellectual property, data information, communication flows, airwaves, internet, free culture, sports, games, playgrounds, roads, streets, parking, sidewalks, plazas, public spaces, national parks, historical sites, museums, libraries, universities, music, dance, arts, crafts, money. Now those are examples of intellectual, social, and cultural commons. But from a whole different modality, we have examples, many examples, and you'll see the differences, of natural and genetic commons. Here we have soil, agriculture, fisheries, wilderness, trees, forests, wetlands, ecosystems, pastures, parks, 
gardens, plants, seeds, algae, topsoil, food crops, photosynthesis, pollination, life forms, species. And lastly, another category of commons is material and social commons, and these include rocks, minerals, metals, chemicals, hydrocarbons, technology, hardware, buildings, the elements, solar energy, wind energy, tides, hydropower, beaches, oceans, lakes, springs, streams, watersheds, aquifers, land, inorganic energy, atmosphere, ozone layer, and the stratosphere. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. You see there's three different broad types of commons. And you can think of it in the categories of uh, the noosphere, the mental categories of commons, the uh, biosphere, which is the body and all living systems of the earth, and also the physiosphere, which is the, the hard elements of, of uh, matter. So all three of those are legitimate kinds of commons. And here it shouldn't perplex the philosophers anymore to recognize that these involve, these, all these commons involve the whole unity of life that we recognize. So there's an important reason why we integrate the commons among these three kind of broad categories, because now we're talking about the management of whole systems. And this obviously is something that's very important, but we really haven't figured out how to do it yet. And now the commons gives us a key to be able to recognize how that's possible. So when we're talking about material and immaterial things, we don't have to get involved in that whole scientific discussion from the past about, well, you can't do that because there's a difference between material and immaterial commons. Now we have a set of principles that bridges that gap. And it's a fantastic thing to be able to utilize because we can bring it now into social policy in a way that hasn't been done before. So to those who question why material and immaterial things are different, um, we can answer that the value of common goods arises through our relationships and connectedness with them. So the value doesn't arise from the objects themselves, it arises from our interaction with those objects and our inner subjectivity with each other in interaction with those objects. This is a distinction that we have not had in Western civilization uh, over the last several centuries. And we know that this is a significant um, characteristic because it is vital to our own sustenance and livelihood, our own individual expression and purpose, and our own social cohesion, quality of life, and well-being. Over the last several centuries, society has gone through this long process of differentiating private goods from public goods. Private goods being managed by markets, commerce, markets uh, in the sense of finance as well as trade, and the public goods which are managed by local governments to state governments. And if you look at the history of the last several centuries, it's been this long process of who's in the ascendancy, private sector, public sector, particularly during the 20th century, this was the main topic of debate um, between the, the, the two sets of uh, uh, resource management regimes. We're going to have to undergo a similar process now of differentiating common goods from both private goods and public goods. Most of us readily identify the differences between private goods and common goods. I'm sorry about the audio cutting in and out, but I don't have any control over that. I don't know if it's a battery problem or, or what. It's hard to say. Uh, at some point, I may just have to abandon this if it's too much of a bother. Um, so we recognize pretty quickly the differences between the private goods and the common goods, but the place we get stuck is the differences between public goods and common goods. Because we tend to think of commons as representing public goods. 
because the state always tells us that that's what they're representing, is the management of resources for the common good. The common good is not the same thing as common goods. They are two different things. They come out of two different traditions. The common good coming out of a utilitarian philosophy like John Stuart Mill versus uh, common goods coming out of a completely different tradition. So that's an important distinction to make. Um, but common goods really, when you think about it, are different from private goods in a very simple way. And if you ever get confused about the, what the differences might be, um, just remember that private goods are produced by businesses and sold to consumers, businesses. Public goods are regulated and provided by governments to their citizens. And common goods are preserved or produced by everyone. This is a really important distinction to make. And um, that way we can really keep clear about what the differences are between common goods and private goods and public goods. So what makes common goods unique is they involve a distinct characteristic that isn't found so much in state management of resources and in the private sector. Strong ethic of cooperation, of inclusion and equal access, free and fair standards, transparency of participatory social practice, of social creativity, and innovation, of mutual benefit, and long-term sustainability. We lost the commons over the centuries through the enclosure of property and the legal enforcement of these enclosures through the commodification of the objects that are in trade into private and public goods, and also through the fungibility of commoning through a universal standard of value. So as these properties began to uh, become known to us, and we were conditioned by them, over a period of time, we lost the thread. We lost our vision of what commoning really was when we were all once commoners. How can people today organize a commons? Well, it's happening all over the world. It's happening, as we know, in the development community, in indigenous cultures, um, and in the internet community, for example. Typically, what is happening now are that people get together and they write a formal commitment or a charter saying, this is why our commons is important. Then they begin to follow the principles of co-governance, co-production, commons trusts, civil society, partnership government, and job creation. And we'll look at each of these individually. Social charters involve a declaration, usually a formal written declaration by a group of stakeholders that is based on customary or emerging identification with an ecology a form of collective labor, a social technology, a community need or shared conviction, a cultural resource area, and an ethnic, religious, or linguistic affinity, or an historical identity. There may be other characteristics, but these are the ones that have been mostly identified in much of the commons literature. This is the basis of why people come together um, and find commonality to create these formal de declarations. Uh, David Bollier and Burns Weston, a couple of scholars in the commons community, have identified these first three aspects of co-governance. The first three characteristics of co-governance have been identified uh, by um, these common scholars that I mentioned. And they involve pluralism, subsidiarity, and polycentrism, uh, to which I've added a fourth. So pluralism involves a wide variety of sh uh, stakeholders participating in uh, decisions that affect them directly. Um, these are pretty standard definitions. Subsidiarity is when citizens take decisions at the lowest possible level of authority. Polycentrism 
which was first identified by uh, Vincent Ostrom, was the decentralized management in the use, protection, and restoration of a resource. And then lastly, I think it's important to identify co-governance in terms of the checks and balances that all this creates, because stakeholders create partnerships for governance that rebalance the market's domination of government. So as the state gives less emphasis to empowering corporations and more emphasis to empowering the people of the commons, then we have a greater balance in society and it creates these checks and balances that I'm referring to. Co-governance is also an extremely important aspect of the commons because it's the collaboration of resource users and producers that really makes this thing work. And this includes many things that you're already familiar with, so it shouldn't be too mysterious. Bartering, gift economies, complementary currencies, and community reciprocity systems, free shops, fair trade markets, producer cooperatives, trade unions, entrepreneurial networks, scientific and academic commons, as well as open source software, open electronic media, shared licensing, collaborative knowledge and design, social networks, creative commons, and copyrights, Wikipedia, websites, file sharing, email, and chat rooms. We're all pretty familiar with those. Those are means of co-production. We're producing a value outside, in most cases, outside of regulation by the state and outside of the uh, generation of fungible value by the marketplace. This is a source of value that we're familiar with, but we haven't named yet, largely. Another aspect of the commons that's important to recognize is that when a community puts together a social charter, um, identifies its co-governance and co-production principles, and really begins to operate effectively, it needs to become a legal entity. And it needs to establish the conditions that are recognized by the state to preserve and manage resources that are inherited from past generations for the benefit of future and present generations. The commons trusts are created uh, as a result of the inability of the state and the market to create the preservation of resources for future generations. There's been attempts to do that, but it's really failed, and that's really what part of the big crisis is today at the global level. That the commons trusts are really the only fiduciary institutions that are accountable for the long-term preservation and sustenance of a resource. There are lots and lots of examples of commons trusts. Uh, the one in the illustration here is a, uh, an example that is here in, in Great Britain. Civil society is another aspect of creating the conditions for a, a meaningful commons. But there's a problem with civil society, as we all know, and, and some of us are try have been trying to articulate it for quite some time. Civil society would like to see itself as a third force, as a counterbalancing mechanism to the state and the private sector. But civil society is definitely a genuine voice of public opinion, but it lacks the authority of electoral legitimacy. Civil society is a group of self-selected interest groups who get together because they're passionate about a particular issue, but they're not elected, they're not necessarily uh, representing a group of stakeholders in their community. Um, and at the same time, they are largely afraid to challenge the constitutional authority of private property, which is inherent in all state constitutions. So we remember from John Locke and others in the field of political philosophy, the reason for the development of constitutions is to enshrine private property as an inherent mechanism in society that you know, there's nothing more important than private property and the state's legal enforcement of the uh, monopoly of private property. So civil society has been afraid to challenge the constitutional mechanisms 
which create enclosures and protection of private property. This is why civil society has yet to become a transformational agent of change, even though it represents a wide range of issues that are absolutely vital to represent at the global level and at the local levels also. But civil society has not stepped up to the realization that resource users have to be involved in the process of production and to move away from the framework of ownership to a framework of trusteeship. Since the sustainable development movement of the 1980s and 90s, uh, civil society has begun to entertain some of these ideas, but it hasn't really broken through to the next level yet because it's seen itself as dependent upon the state and the market for funding and for guidance and for leadership. The fact is that civil society is providing its own leadership and expertise to uh, the market and the state, but it has not recognized its true value yet because it still sees itself as part of the market system. As long as civil society accepts state regulation and market-based kinds of means of creating value, we're not going to get very far down the road. Um, this is why the commons can infuse civil society now with a whole new sense of its meaning and purpose. Another aspect that's very important to identify is partnership government. Mike, Michelle Bowens, who was the first uh, uh, of the speakers of the remarkable commoners to speak before you, has identified the principle of the partner state. This is getting beyond the welfare state and the social market and the, um, the, uh, the kinds of uh, governance frameworks we've seen in the 20th century. We're really evolving into something different now. Uh, the partnership government uh, is not just the state. It also involves local government and regional government. And it's important to see that because collaborative governance between communities and civil society and business and government are all part of the, the commons perspective. It's just that it, the, the impetus to do this is now coming not from the markets and the state, but from people themselves who are managing their own resources. Participatory engagement and deliberative democracy by people in the creation of their own resource boundaries, rules, and policies is really at the essence of what is needed. And the support system for the commons comes from this partnership government. So as I said earlier, the state is going to have to give less attention to the primacy of corporations and far more attention to the primacy of the commons because it's the commons that provide the fuel for state management and for the development, extraction, and production of resources that the, the market is reliant on. It's a, a peculiar situation in which the state and the market are totally dependent upon the commons, but they don't have any vocabulary for it. They claim that the commons freely exist in nature, and therefore they're, they're, they're for the taking. And so there's a, a complete denial, really, of the virtue and the, um, the meaning of the commons. The last aspect that I think is really important, that policymakers will be taking note of, as George Poor indicated, with the loss of jobs coming up in the future, is that there is a really fine way that people have to create jobs in the local communities. People can pool their collective wealth to fund local projects. Um, this happened to some extent during the Great Depression in the 1930s. But it's probably going to happen in, in a much larger way now coming into the future. Local investment through development trusts can support self-reliance and empowerment of commons activities. <coughs> commons wealth funds, not corporations or states, can become the impetus of job creation. Now, look around and you don't see this happening very widely yet. Uh, a lot of us in the commons field are still struggling to support ourselves because we understand that uh, this is a vital principle. But value is being created through the means of the commons that is not being created through the private sector and the state. This is really important to recognize because this idea of the commons is actually working with co-evolutionary principles that we're, are going to take hold as time goes on. They're actually exploding right now. Society is racing to catch up with these concepts. 
And as time goes on, you will be hearing more and more about the commons. So how, in fact, will this transform the present system? These social charters and co-governance and co-production and commons trusts and civil society and partnership governments and job creation means that are characterized here. The number one principle, in my view, is that consumers become the producers of their own resources. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to go out and be able to make my own television set. But it means that we can identify certain ways that people can produce their own resources. And as we do this, we increase the means of production, or the, we increase the distribution of the means of production across society. This is very important because when resource users become directly involved in the production of a commons resource, their motivations and their knowledge and skills become part of the production praxis. And this leads to new ways of interacting and coordinating natural, social, and economic life. When resource users become producers, they can create a trust. The trust puts a cap on the preservation value of a resource. The trusts are generally created to preserve depletable resources, as we know in the, in the natural world and the, the material world, the mineral world, for example. But trusts can also be created to enhance or protect re, uh, replenishable resources that we also see in the natural world, social commons, cultural commons, intellectual, digital, and solar commons. So trusts can be a vital principle here to, to, to protect a resource for future generations. This resource cap is a vital principle because the trustees of commons set a strict limit on the extraction or use of a resource according to non-monetized intergenerational metrics, including sustainable quality of life and well-being indicators. It's not time to go into many of these indicators right now, but, um, but these would all go into the development of the resource cap. And this protects the commons safely for future generations, unlike any mechanisms now generated by the state and the private sector. They're not thinking long term. They're working with a different set of metrics, like discounting the future, which actually is um, uh, helping to uh, create many of the problems that we have today. So this would be the only institution in society that is based upon preserving resources for the future, for future generations, uh, that it exists. And it's something that we obviously need very much. Now, this system isn't about destroying the private sector or seizing the state, because in this big tent that we're developing here with the commons, businesses definitely benefit, and so does the state. So it's not about changing the system by throwing out the bombs or anything like that. In fact, businesses are really important in this process. The tr and uh, as we all know, um, global civilization would be uh, really in fewer conditions if we didn't have businesses leading the way in many ways. But we also know that there's been a downside to the development of, of corporate charters over the years. But in this scheme that we're outlining here, the trust would rent a proportion of the resources beyond the cap to the private sector or to the state businesses and utilities that operate. Um, so the cap is set and then the uh, the resources that are outside the cap, that are thought to be available for present generations, are rented to businesses. And the private sector profits from the extraction and production of the resources outside the cap, just as it does today. The state is also transformed because, as mentioned previously, this, the government shifts its emphasis from creating corporate charters and licensing the private sector to supporting the protocols and boundaries and legal rules for the commons that are established through non-closure movements, that's the opposite of enclosing property, movements to, to, toward non-closure, and through social charters and commons trusts. This tax on businesses and trusts is very important because then it generates uh, something for the state to do a very vital role. A percentage of the revenue of businesses and the resource rents that are paid to trusts are taxed. 
when the state redistributes these funds to citizens as dividends or subsistence income, it invests these taxes uh, in the restoration of depleted resources, land, oceans, and the atmosphere, and it also uses these funds to enhance replenishable resources, such as free culture, the arts, collaborative knowledge, and peacekeeping measures. This represents a new dynamism in society. We don't have to scuttle the old um, capitalist system completely, but we definitely transform it as we move forward. These seven commons principles are really uh, very interesting because they lead to the idea that the commons is a third sector beyond civil society, transforming civil society, but it, in fact it's its own uh, mechanism or its own dynamic. And it also gives greater scope to recognizing that when we have a society that is utilizing private goods and public goods and common goods, we're actually creating a larger commons in which the private sector and public sector are parts. They're subsidiary parts in larger biospheric commons. And that's important for people to recognize because obviously under the present system, we think that the private sector and public sector are completely dominant. And they are dominant, but epistemologically, uh, we, we need to jump to this new level to recognize that they are really subsidiary parts of the greater system. So how do we do this? These seven principles would be ending the division of labor to the extent possible. Resource users become the co-producers of their own goods, as I had said, through things that we're already familiar with, mutual platforms, networked collaboration, peer-to-peer -peer production, employee-operated businesses and cooperatives. The second thing is that these commons will generate new sources of value. Long-term value is not generated through the potential financial revenue of common assets. So we're not monetizing the commons. That's not how we're creating value. Value arises instead through the preservation of commons resources and the enhancement of the global commons to support life and life systems. We also build a non-closure movement for those who are activists who want to get out there and do something and protest because it's very important to have nonviolent protest to reverse the enclosures of water and the atmosphere and the hydraulic fracking that, are taking, uh, that is taking place to um, capture natural gas and seed commons and many other commons. We've got to reverse the, from a moral point of view and also from a functional point of view and from the point of view of the preservation of the planet, many of these enclosures have to be rolled back. Um, this is going to take a lot of negotiation, obviously. This would bring resource overuse and deterioration um, to an end because it's these enclosures that are leading to failed commons, resource conflict, and security crises. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I come out of the field of development, and nobody can figure out why development keeps failing. But it keeps failing because we don't take seriously the, the principle that at the grassroots level, the resource users have to become the producers of their own resources. So we throw foreign aid at uh, developing countries, we, we want uh, market-based solutions, and the answer is right in, in front of us. And many people in the development field know the answer, but they're not, their voices are not being heard. There are a few people in civil society who do recognize this, but mostly this voice is coming from the common sector at this point. Because, as I say, the people in the development community have their own set of protocols and paradigms that come out of the post-war view of how to manage um, development in a completely different way than we're envisioning today. So it's important that a, a non-closure movement comes from a very principled place of indignancy, being indignant with self-righteous indignation about these enclosures and resisting any form of external control that does not promote life, dignity, security, and well-being. Not in a violent sense of protest, but in a sense that really challenges the system and says, look, 
This has got to end. And we're putting ourselves on the line here for this principle. Um, not everybody is going to be a activist in this sense. Others of us can think about the movement, can take part in analysis and other things. But for those who really want to get active, this is a, a, a very important avenue. The fourth principle that I think is extremely important to recognize is that we need to transform ownership through trusteeship. Ownership, if you really go back into history, is a false construction. We, in this lifetime, we don't own anything. It's a social protocol that we've all developed that we agree to, it's kind of a consensus illusion, that we think that we own something, but at the end of our life we realize that we never owned anything anyway. Um, Marxism and communism also showed that collective ownership is subject to social hierarchy and abuse. Because a co-owned property can be managed by a majority and exploited and divided, whether it's managed equi equitably or not. This is the great lesson that we learned from the Marxist movement. Trusteeship, however, is not ownership of the means of production. It's production of the means of non-ownership. So, applying this principle then, the commons trusts begin to recognize that we have to establish the principle of non-ownership of property because they are dedicated to uh, future generations. They're preserving the value of resources for future generations so there's enough left for the future people of the planet and life forms and species of the planet. The trusts involve the participation of users and producers, providers, in the preservation, production, or use of a resource. The trusts hold and manage this resource as a common property for existing and future generations. The next principle that's very important, as I've touched on earlier, is cap and rent. The resource is capped, and the amount outside the cap is then rented to the private sector so that we create, continue to create the private incentives in society, but we also preserve resources for future generations. You can think about it this way. In the uh, field of fluid dynamics and thermodynamics um, uh, area of physics, people talk about the stock and flow. What we're doing is stocking, or is, is capping the stock of resources on the planet um, through preservation and appropriation. And we're renting the flow of matter and energy through allocation and use meaning through production, consumption, and income. And lastly, following the work of Eleanor Ostrom and the academic commons community, who have identified the key principles and characteristics of commoners to make successful commons, at least these areas of moral and intersubjective concern have to come to the forefront that we recognize the basis of the commons in communication and creativity and trust, cooperation, autonomy, liberation, benevolence, altruism, sociability, friendship, reciprocity, civic virtue, empathy, goodwill. And these are very important ethics. But in the past, often we've seen these as adjuncts or expectations of Western liberalism. And we've seen them as uh, a force that is represented by the social justice movement and uh, the, the moral philosophers that we've recognized over the centuries. We haven't really looked at this before as a structural principle. And that's what the commons can provide to us, a means by which we can understand the intersubjectivity and the shared meaning and the value of resources in a brand new way that is actually part and parcel of the ethics of the planet as they're evolving. So that's local commons. <coughs> now global commons. It's a different kettle of fish, but what we're trying to do is standardize the two worlds. It's not easy to do because they have different perspectives. Commons rights are an important 
area to examine. The historical rights to local commons have their basis in natural or customary law. They were traditions established by community, and these informal norms then became a matter later of civil law. But to begin with, they were part of natural law. The global commons have their basis today in public trust doctrine and public domain. Public trust and public domain say that unrestricted open access to resources should be managed as public property. Well, that sounds good, and that's part of the canon of Western philosophy, but or Western political philosophy, that is. But what we have, however, is a different kind of situation altogether at the global level. The doctrine of international public domain and open access, it sounds so wonderful. It's for the public. What could be better? But the problem is that the historical claims to the public domain and open access to the property of all of humanity claims that resources must be managed and allocated by a few, meaning a few individual states or the club of nation states, which in effect are managed by a G20, which is a small club of states, on behalf of the rest of the world, on behalf of the G192. So what we have, in a sense, is a uh, the principle of ownership taken to the global level, in which ownership isn't claimed, but the right to manage these resources by an elite is claimed. And that is the meaning of public domain and open access at the international level. And as I mentioned earlier with Garrett Hardin's mistake of applying the idea of open access to the local level, we're making the same kind of mistake at the international level. We don't have adequate rules and regulations to pertain to the management of global resources as they appear at the inner area of the atmosphere or outer space or uh, the Arctic or the ocean seabeds or the, the high seas. Many other examples of global commons as well. The legal basis for the global commons, whether in public trust doctrine, public domain, national constitutions, and international treaties, protocols, and conventions, is government sovereignty. That is the main principle. It's not the inalienable value of the resources. It comes down to the principle of government sovereignty, whether it's through the club of states acting in concert, or whether it's through the individual state recognizing that their sovereignty emphasizes the management of their own territory and the consent of the people that they, they govern on behalf of the resources within that state. So when decisions are made about the global commons, the commons that exist outside national borders, all claims on the commons must be approved by each state as a nominal member of this larger community of states. So it's the international club that makes decisions about the, the global commons. And what we recognize is, again, that it comes down to the national priorities and self-interest of individual states that stem from the sovereign right to development that determine whether natural resources may be conserved, exploited, or destroyed. So this is what we're up against. It amounts to exclusive and non-sustainable use of the global commons by individual states. The global commons, therefore, is left without effective measures of enforcement or development. In the dialogue that we've had over the years, particularly since World War II, with nation states getting together and discussing global issues. The global talks have been um, increasingly representative, increasingly more cross-sectoral, and increasingly more interdisciplinary. But this trend has to continue, and it has to continue rapidly to integrate all of the different representatives and cross-sectoral uh, levels of society and issues. And uh, the interdisciplinary departments of society, and uh, the, including the academic world and uh, the uh, political uh, policy world and uh, many other domains. This sounds like an enormous task, and it is, because uh, it hasn't been done. But global development, aid, environment, trade, finance, monetary policy, energy, climate change, human security, and political security must all be integrated sooner or later. 
and we've seen the interdependency of all these things. We recognize it all the time. We're continually drawing new connections between all these different issues. And the problem has been that we don't have a forum to be able to discuss this and to properly manage it at the global level. In the 1970s, a very interesting movement started called the Common Heritage of Mankind. And today we've um, created a, a new rubric for it. Of, we call it Common Heritage of Humanity because it's, uh, it's a, a little more polite terminology. Um, it included, at that time, discussions on food and cultural legacies, uh, seabeds beyond coastal jurisdictions. Uh, and by the way, the Law of the Sea Treaty came out of uh, this discussion in the 1970s. Uh, the Antarctic and the Moon satellite orbits and space communications. Solar energy, technology, and commodities were discussed. Uh, endangered species, genetic uh, genetics and rainforests, as well as the atmosphere and ocean resources. These were all discussed. This is not, I'm not referring to the environmental movement, I'm referring to a movement that existed within the framework of the United Nations, which discussed the common heritage of Earth's living systems for quite some time during the 1970s, which is a fact that's been largely forgotten. But we have amnesia for a particular reason about this. And the dialogue hasn't really continued at the same level since the 1970s, particularly around, oh, say, 1978, 79, 80, when Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and Helmut Kohl were elected. Because neoliberalism today has really denied any value of the commons, because the commons are all now market-based. Uh, economic totalization is the real word for globalization. The, transfer, the transnational platform of markets and states has been called by authors such as Philip Bobbitt and Philip Plon uh, the market state. And this is a pretty good terminology for what's taking place today. It's not neoliberalism. We have a monolithic structure which is a market state. And it um, exploits the commons continually. And it exists in a way that cannot recognize the commons and refuses to recognize the commons. I think that there's a way to get inside of the system at the international level. And of course it's going to take through take place through diplomacy and negotiation. And, but as we know uh, from the history lesson that we learned from Bretton Woods, which is when the United States and Great Britain inaugurated the system of international finance and monetary policy in 1944 in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, we recognized that the value system of the world completely changed at that point. We recognized now the primacy of monetary systems in the world my suggestion is the commons movement needs to take this very seriously now that particularly that the um, international financial system and monetary system are breaking down. Why isn't the economy managed as a commons? Well, there are many reasons for it, but I'd like to take you back in history just briefly to the writings of John Locke and Rene Descartes in the 17th century, they taught Western civilization to regard the mind or the newosphere and nature or the biosphere as separate things. And they had an elaborate philosophy around that. Now Descartes was dangerous on his own terms because a lot of what he said was translated into social policy. But it was John Locke who was particularly dangerous in some ways because he was a political philosopher as well as a metaphysical philosopher. So many of his ideas were translated into politics. So he provided a justification for the constitutionality of private property by saying that the, there was a legitimate metaphysical justification for the split between mind and body. Um, we, we're all aware of this mind-body split in, in many ways. I mean, we, we all live with the reification of it every day because society is based on the idea that there is a um, 
there is a uh, rich world and a poor world, which is analogous to a mind and body, in a sense. We recognize that there are surplus nations and deficit nations. We have a, a number of means of analysis which stem from this mind-body split, um, and there are many more. Uh, economics has been influenced by this mind-body split, but the main point I'm coming down to with this is that economics doesn't see a connection between individual economic decisions and the natural environment. This is very important, obviously, today. The financial and monetary worlds have been split. Behaviorism, positivism, and utilitarian ideas over the last couple of centuries have also stressed the primacy of fact or rational mind over value of nature and human subjectivity and shared meaning. Uh, this is more important to some people in the realm of philosophy, but it has direct implications to social policy and political policy because business and finance have been shaped by a philosophy, particularly since the 19th century, with the, um, the uh, utilitarian movement, um, in which uh, the commons are denied completely and business and finance are treated as the source of monetary or currency value. This is a very important distinction because what we're saying with this philosophy is that all value is created through the marketplace. And we, we don't have any language, adequate language, for the recognition that at one time we did have a gold standard. Now, wait a minute, value came from gold, which is a resource, that can, uh, a resource that came from nature. And today we have a de facto resource, oil, which is providing value to our currency. But policymakers are in complete denial of that, some because of ignorance and others, and, and also because of the heavy influence of Locke and Descartes and uh, positivism and behaviorism and utilitarian philosophy, but also from the well worked out, more or less cybernetic philosophies of von Mises and von Hayek, which told us and continue to tell us that value is created by the exchange of goods and services through the marketplace. We have denied the source of value coming from our natural commons, from our social commons, our intellectual commons, our genetic commons, our material commons. We're denying that. And it's part of the reason why we're imposing that value system on our economic philosophy, and we're trying to live by that. And that's an example, as I said earlier, about all of us being reified by the social policies that are based on this mind-body split. So what it produces in us is a mind-body split because we see ourselves on one hand as workers, on another hand as uh, consumers, on another hand as producers. Where is the unification there? Well, Marx tried to isolate us as labor, laborers, which is a very important commons distinction. But we're also uh, commoners who raise families, who are producers, who are uh, generating other kinds of, uh, of social value and cultural value and intellectual and all the other kinds of commons value that are created. What we've got to do now is heal the financial and monetary system and bring them back together to recognize that economy is a subsidiary part of the biosphere. This is what's been missing. This is what the mind-body split did to us. It cut off the economy from nature. Today, the settlement of national accounts with the world's biophysical imbalances requires a monetary framework based on an agreement that the newosphere is part of the biosphere. It's essential that we go in that direction because now we can harness our competitive instincts to become a strategy of collective rather than individual survival. Leaders of the world have to represent both the future and present generations and also speak for the common heritage of Earth's living and non-living systems, which they're not doing today. This requires a new kind of intergenerational planning that's based not on geopolitical or corporate objectives, but on global common resource distribution that's relative to the population growth of the planet and the Earth's ecological carrying capacity. Now we know that, but why are we not applying it? Because we really haven't made the precautionary principle a structural part of society. Giving the same weight to the welfare of future generations of people 
and planetary life forms as we give to those now living obliges us to increase the present wealth per capita. We can do that. It is possible to have growth at this point. The deniers of growth uh, say that we can't have that. We, we're, leading in, we're going into an age of austerity. Not necessarily. The use of a precautionary resource cap would transform the balance of trade, finance, and aid for the current generation and also create sustainable environmental conditions for us today. But the 64 quadrillion dollar, quadrillion pound question that's on everybody's lips is how do we do generate prosperity today when we are also trying to limit destructive economic growth across the planet? How can we do that? Well, this question comes out of the old model. It comes out of the market state model. If we listen to the solutions coming from the market state, we'll never go in this direction. The monetary system itself, not the financial system, has to become part of the finite biospheric commons with its inflows of raw materials and outflows of wastes. This global adjustment would be based on two factors. The withdrawal rates of depletable resources have to be slowed to allow stocks to catch up with flows. That's in including the depletable resources we know today across the planet. The second thing is that the withdrawal rates of renewable resources are equilibrated with their replenishment rates. And this, in and of itself, is the adjustment that would bring local and global commons fully into scale and make the economy a component part of the environment. We can do this because today we have this eco-digital technology that enables us to do things in real time across the planet. Social media and satellite technology are now fusing with natural resource commons. And this enables an instant Participate, participate, participation excuse me, in resource information gathering on a planetary basis. We can track a variety of commons today in real time. If we were to create, through this means, a new reserve system, the common assets of the entire planet could form the basis of a composite standard of value we could create a reserve basket of global common goods, just as the way the gold, uh, the gold standard worked at one time and the oil standard in a de facto sense works today. Only this would involve a wide variety of different kinds of commons. So what would we put in this resource basket? Commons reserve index could include cultural resources, social resources, intellectual resources, natural resources, genetic resources, as well as the physical resources like um, golden oil. They wouldn't be precluded from this. Everything of value would be put in this basket and averaged on a daily basis to come up with a sustainability rate. And this index of the sustainability rate uh, linkages among the various commons is continuously updated and it establishes a value for our money. So instead of being dictated by a central bank like the Fed, which creates a standard of value that percolates across the world, and all the other uh, central banks salute to the standard that the discount rate that's set by the Fed in Washington. Instead of doing something like that, we could have scientists and a group of engineers and politicians and civil society people all collaborate on a, a project that has lots and lots of transparency, that creates a set of indicators that boils down to a daily or hourly or momentary value that expresses the relative scarcity and replenishability of the world's key resources and reflects the capacity of the global commons and that maintains an exclu inclusive wealth for global society. To make this adjustment, both at the level of financing and debt and at the level of finite biological and material resources and renewable resources, the sustainability rate would be created 
entirely independent of interest rates and market goods and services. We would cr create a new kind of metrics. We would get off the debt cycle by getting away from interest rates. The value expressed through this sustainability rate in every exchange of goods and services is secured by the resilience and diversity of the world's social, cultural, intellectual, natural, genetic, material, and solar resources. How does this work? As you make a decision to spend money or to receive money in each transaction that you make, the deficit or surplus is accounted with reference to this global sustainability rate. If the sustainability rate is low, your money is worth less relative to its value in an exchange, which may cause you to spend less or perhaps not spend or to postpone your spending. Now, if the sustainability rate is higher, the money that you have is worth more in the exchange, which may convince you as a buyer to spend more. The signals now are not coming, as Adam Smith and Von Hayek said, through prices. They're coming through the actual scarcity of resources and the cost of environmental damage and social disparities that are conveyed directly through our money. It's our purchasing power that's of paramount importance. When global sustainability is expressed through currency value, each one of us has an immediate realization of the potential impact of our purchasing power in spending, saving, or investing decisions. And this makes it worth less to each of us to do ecological and social harm and worth more to be ecologically and socially restorative because it hits us in the pocketbook, whatever decision we make. Self-interest is definitely involved here. We're not denying that. But at the same time, it's not self-interest based on prices. It's a completely different concept. Every personal spending decision that you would make or not make is a vote. Each use of money, whether the sustainability rate is low or high, is literally a vote for the minimization of social inequities and the longevity and regeneration and diversity of the planet's common goods. The sustainability rate enables buyers and sellers to determine the value of their own production and consumption. It's based on the capacity of the global commons to sustain the quality of life and well-being of present and future generations and Earth's living systems. How on Earth do we do this? Where do we start? How can we get this going? How do we make this economic adjustment? We have to get back to bridging the gap between the local commons and the global commons. If we don't do that, we can't talk policymakers into creating this kind of structure. We need a much deeper awareness and stronger identity between local and global commons. The local commons groups need the technical support and knowledge of a commons-based multilateralism. We needn't be afraid at the local level of a multilateralism that is much more enlightened, as we have been afraid of globalization. But global rules and institutions must also embody the expertise and skills and transparency and accountability that comes from uh, groups at the grassroots levels. We can scale up and down from the commons if we were to do this. The expertise and understanding that people have developed through local management of resources has to be scaled up to the global level. The policymakers and leaders at the international level are clueless right now about how to manage global resources. But the, at the local level, the local people at the grassroots also need an international support system that is generative, not technological or technocratic and nationalistic or commercial. New incentives for sharing the global commons have to be built into global rules and institutions. So it's got to work both ways. It's got to work in parallel. And it's not us versus them. And lo local commoners and grassroots movements have to realize that. Ultimately, the post-war system that we've devised after um, the Second World War was a system which um, was uh, uh, a great in innovation at the time. But, um, but it's failed. And it was a great innovation because the Depression and World War II brought about a realization that we really needed international solutions. And 
having been chastened by the harrowing experiences of the 30s and 40s, the international community created some marvelous structures for international security and trade and finance and monetary policy. Over the years, those structures have crystallized and they've become the enemy, in fact. But at the time, they were a great innovation because they took us away from a laissez-faire philosophy to global public goods at the international level that we could meaningfully talk about human about uh, military security and peace at the United Nations and trade through organizations like the GATT and now the World Trade Organization and finance through the IMF and money through the Bank for International Settlements and the IMF. But as we know, these are now the institutions which are causing many of the problems because they're still beholden to individual states. So how do we get to the next level? We have to recognize that what, what we're up against is international liberalism because the United Nations and many liberal internationalists have called the resources of the particular regimes created after World War II global public goods. And for most of us, this sounds like a really good thing. But in fact, we have to differentiate now global private goods, which we are familiar with through the multinational corporations, the global public goods, which are claimed by international liberalism on the behalf of developing countries, to get to the point where we recognize there's such a thing as global common goods. States must now give legitimacy and authority to new global institutions and international standards for the management and protection of global common goods. It's very important, not only at the local level, but at the international level. Global common goods can be created and have to be created because we recognize that solutions are needed to the problems of international resources that are identified to, uh, as global common goods to be able to better manage their long-term risks. This is absolutely important as we move forward because it's the preservation of the world's resources that's really paramount at this point. Are we going to have wars over resources, resource conflict ad infinitum into the future if we continue to have neoliberalism as it's being pushed by the G20 right now? Um, all of these uh, issues are very familiar to us. We've been defining them as global public goods, or at least the United Nations has, and international liberalism has, including food, and clean water, and the atmosphere, and energy, and housing, and healthcare, education, information, jobs, nuclear proliferation, peaceful management of resource conflict, security of global supplies, and representation of poor nations in global decision making. We're calling those global public goods. They're in fact global common goods. To take this a step further, the co-production of global common goods can be facilitated through collaboration between local resource users and global institutions. Nations would collectively agree to preserve and protect the various commons of Earth and maintain a pool of shared resources and goods large enough to provide for everyone's sustenance needs. Many of the resources required for production and the goods they produce would go into this common resource pool. And from that pool, the goods which many people need would come from uh, that particular uh, mass warehouse as it's structured. The surplus is therefore re recycled at the international level. The system we created after World War II set up a, a system in which we have surplus nations and deficit nations. We've come to call them developed nations and um, developing nations. But over a period of time, many of the developing nations are now surplus nations. And many of the richer nations, which were formerly rich, the, the so-called developed nations, are now becoming deficit nations, as we know in the US and Britain and many areas in Europe. This is all a jumble. And we don't have a clear definition of how to move forward politically at this point. It doesn't, it doesn't add up economically and it doesn't add up politically. But in the future, if we set up a, a resource pool like this, which is a proposal that John Maynard Keynes took to Bretton Woods in 1944, which was rejected by the Americans, rich nations could recycle their excess resources into this global clearinghouse, which are then redistributed to poor nations needing assistance. 
at this point, we could really say that the commons now come into scale through this trans-local collaboration. Both local and global commons are governed through values, principles, and rules that are negotiated by a community to preserve and produce its resources. So the commons are organized through social charters, co-governance, co-production, commons trusts, civil society, partnership government, and job creation, through ending the division of labor, through generating new sources of value, by building a non-closure movement, by transforming ownership through trusteeship, by creating commons trusts, by establishing cap and rent, and developing a new ethic of commoning. In conclusion, we have to recognize that the picture I've painted is very stark where we have three sectors. In practice, there are many hybrids, because as we see the from the Venn diagram here, there are places where the private sector overlaps with the commons, and there are places where the public sector overlaps with the commons. So there's a lot of interpenetration here and we're familiar with some of those examples. For example, the, um, the interpenetration of the market and the commons, how the markets are embedded in the commons, uh, can be illustrated by several examples. Community-supported agriculture is an example of, common, of the market being embedded in the commons. So are open source uh, software companies and copyright law in, um, in uh, commons licensing. These are all ways that the market has become embedded in the commons. And from a commons point of view, these are legitimate areas. They're hybrids or overlaps, which are OK. So in other words, it's not just this stark area where we have three separate sectors, because there are partnerships that evolve in each of these sectors. And we would not want to get rid of trusteeships by the state of particular commons that we've known through national parks and forests and fisheries and the wildlife management that we've come to understand as being beneficial, uh, and many other examples, like research and um, uh, museums and highways, uh, that the state is involved in a particular kind of resource management that works. So it's not as cut and dried a picture as I painted it, but I painted it this way so that you can begin to differentiate the importance of the commons from the private and public sector and not be fooled by the kinds of partnerships that are being promoted today by neoliberalism. It's very important that commons becomes its own third sector to differentiate the commons from the market and the state. This establishes the identity, the integrity, and the value of the commons. And it allows political self-determination and economic self-provisioning at the commons level. It's very important. The differentiation is the first step, but the second step that uh, we can recognize is a, uh, it comes out of the dialectical process that Carl Polanyi, who wrote The Great Transformation, first identified. He said that there was a time when we had market-centered societies, mar I'm sorry, society-centered markets. And then in the 19th century, that evolved into market-centered societies. He was anticipating a kind of commons movement, although he didn't have the language back in the 1940s when he was writing. But that's what we have today, the possibility of commons-based exchange as a synthesis of this dialectical movement from society-centered markets to market-centered societies to something brand new today. So as in any synthesis, the new term includes and transcends the former terms. So there will be many aspects of the market and state in this third sector, but what's necessary to recognize is that we first have to differentiate and then reintegrate the commons with the market and the state. And as we do that, we begin to recognize that the market and the state are subsidiary parts of the greater commons in which we all exist. This is the key to bridging the gap between local commons and global commons. Thank you for your attention, and um, it was a great pleasure to uh, give you this talk.
almost as each slides, I wanted to stop, James. I want to have a question to ask. And uh, actually, I have uh, two kinds of questions, and I think that I was not alone with having a lot of questions going floating in our minds. One kind of question is about uh, clarification, just simply, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? The other kind of questions I had is, okay, now I understand this, and, and what are we going to do with this? So here we are, uh, 30 of us, uh, who came to learn about it. What, can, what is the practical thing that we can go home with? So uh, if you remember, one picture in one of the slides was a basket. Do you remember the basket? It was, uh, I guess it was a common goods uh, basket. And uh, I really want you to know that the School of Commoning is not only about uh, teaching and learning about the commons, but uh, we are committed to organize ourselves as a commons. What it means is that we recognize a set of commons resources that the school has, and one of the most important, most, one of the most important resources is your questions and my questions and all the questions that we don't have answers for all the questions that we don't only don't have don't have answers for but also we don't have time for addressing them all so what if we take uh, 10 minutes because we are they are going to throw us out uh, from here sooner or later what if we take uh, 10 minutes from questions and answers it would be clearly not possible to address all, but because all the questions, even the ones that you are not speaking of, are essential resources of a potential commons that the School of Commoning wants to become. So I would like to invite you to do not forget your questions, but come to our website. The URL is in the uh, leaflet. Come to the website, register. There is a conversation space there and open a conversation about your questions so that we can ensure that each and every commoner present will be good steward of the common assets that you are carrying in your mind. 